<laughs> and so I guess you can tell it that it's sort of all the same. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I like to get it right in that moment when the light bulb is coming on, but it's flickering, you know. Um, <coughs> and so I'll do that as much as, as much as I can. And sometimes, you know, five people think, but only one person had enough, you know, was brave enough to ask the question, you know. Um, and it was, yeah, I was wondering that too, you know. And so, so some of this is also to have the uh, the earnestness and and the boldness, you know, like, uh, in a group to, you know, like, uh, to, to ask, ask the question. Um, okay, should I? So I think uh, I'd like to start with um, kind of our understanding of Conscience, because you know we don't. A lot of things we don't talk about within in, in Buddhism directly doesn't mean that there is not an indirect a- application. For instance, uh, 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 I was teaching at a Jewish center, and they asked me. They said, "Well, what does the Buddha say about forgiveness?" I said, "Well, you know, we don't." talk that much about forgiveness because we do talk a lot about non-judgment. None of you haven't judged it, you know, uh, or we, we might, uh, you know, so we talk about abandoning the qualities, unwholesome qualities that would require you to have to come back and forgive either yourself or the, or the other person. And so, so then I asked him, and what does yours say? He said, forget, um, but never forgive. I said, really? <laughs> he said, I said, well, how's that working for you? you know, because it, it appears that there's no forgetting and there's no forgiving, and that's why you're still suffering. You know, and, and I began to talk to them about um, abandoning their uh, hatred and abandoning their fear and you know, and they just burst out in tears. I mean, like the whole group of them started crying because they never had, uh, it was like a, 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 a dam filled up to overflowing and, and the pressure was so, uh, was so great on them, but they had no particular teaching to relieve, to relieve the pressure. And so it was, it's wonderful. It's these times that I really appreciate the Dharma, even when it's trying to encourage me to, some, to do something that, or consider something, or act upon something, that, and I'm not inclined to resolve it that way, you know. So, uh, but I, I like that the instruction still comes. And if I say, well, that's uh, that's too big of a pill to swallow, and so just keep sucking on it. You know, after a while, you bring it down. Because see, while you're sucking on it, you're actually dissolving it in little bits, and you don't even know that you are. But one day, you just wake up, and suddenly, that's palatable. Suddenly, that's a preferred um, method of resolving something. And you wonder, huh, when did I change? You know, uh, you don't feel like you've changed. You feel like you've always felt this way, or that you've always felt this way. What other way is there to think? You know, and that's that's the um, I always call it that's the power, the mighty power of of 
of the Dharma is that this transformation occurs and it doesn't have to be difficult. It doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't take so much efforting. The effort is, is really in the willingness to allow yourself to be thoroughly washed in the Dharma. The, the willingness is what takes is what takes the effort, you know. Uh, I remember, like, you know, we would try to wash our dog in the bathtub. Boy, was that an ordeal, you know. And, uh, I mean, the dog was splashing and just didn't want you had to try. You have to get in the tub with the dog is what, <laughs> is what happens in order, you know, to finish this thing. You just have to get in there with it. And so that's what you find in the Dharma. You find, you know, like, there's no point in me out here struggling with it. I just get in the tub with it, you know. And now I'm enjoying myself instead of struggling with something. It just depends on, you know, how, how we understand what its purpose is and our willingness to, like, just go with the flow. If there's a song that says, just give it up. Just let it go, just let it go. So this whole thing is a practice of letting go, letting go of all the things we've tapped on to ourselves, just letting go. And after a while, we start to see even there's a self that's been tapped on, and we even, we even let that go, and it becomes effortless. So I don't hear people say too much about um, conscience, and actually how I got to this talk was... Um, Bonte kept waiting for me to send in something. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, I thought I sent it in. Um, and then when he asked me about it, uh, maybe uh, um, two weeks ago, uh, asked my, my assistant, and I said, Trish, I think I sent something a long time ago. I went out to the website and it was something there. I said, yeah, see, I sent something. And he said, no, I just made that up. <laughs> that shame has the characteristic of being disgusted with evil. You know how you can do something and I'll be like, you're disgusted with yourself. You may not let another person know, but you inside, you're like, why did I do that? You know, or you can even be doing it and, mm -hmm. and, you, and the disgust arises. You know, but you don't stop yourself or you're just not skillful enough, enough at that time to stop yourself. But you're hating every minute of what you're doing, or what, you, what you're saying, or what you're thinking. And so he says that before we can change that, we have to become absolutely disgusted with the wrongdoing, that, that we can see it um, as evil. When I say evil, I mean it's not useful, it's not beneficial, it's not helpful, and it's just plain wrong. We don't like, like right, the word right the word wrong nowadays, but he says that, that we should really be able to tell by what that uneasy feeling that rises up in us when we know we're not uh, respecting ourselves, we're not giving ourselves our, 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 highest, our highest respect. So if you think of it in that way when you get that check inside about, um, you know, is this action, is this uh, speech, is this thought lining up with the uh, with my highest uh, uh, ideal with with what I really think is right? Sometimes we do an incorrect thing or unbeneficial thing, or we really thought we were doing the right thing. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when we know we're on that little slippery slope, and yet because of fear or uh, because of of um, Sometimes we do things because of fear. Sometimes we do it because of spite. Sometimes we do it out of anger. Sometimes um, we do it because we don't know anything else to do. Mm -hmm. And and but yet there was that check that said, "No, this is not right. Do you really have to do this?" You know? 
And so he says that we develop a disgust with that, uh, but it's dominated, you see, by that sense of self-respect, respect for one's, uh, for oneself, and that manifests as conscience. So now Atisha, who lived around the uh, year 1000 AD, uh, <clears throat> he broke down some steps to developing this kind of respect for oneself and, uh, and for understanding the repercussions, the fruit of certain actions. And um, uh, in his uh, exposition of Lamb Realm, the stages on the path, he's like, yeah, I, I, get, I get the general idea, but exactly how do I train myself, exactly how do I train myself, you know, to, uh, to step into my highest goals and my highest sense of self-respect so that there is not this internal uh, con condemnation. And so <clears throat> he did an exposition on the six transcendences. And these are, are um, a practice to develop certain spiritual qualities that help us uh, overcome uh, our, our tendency for, for um, wrong self-protection, trying to protect ourselves, but in a way that we cause harm to others, and that we often, um, it's like trying to get, take the easy way out, uh, trying to take the path of least resistance, uh, doing it because you can't, um, you know, these kinds of things. And how these thoughts continually come to us, and how we should face them each time they come. And so the six transcendences uh, that allow us to have a purified conscience uh, it's giving, morality, patience, effort, uh, meditative absorption, and wisdom. That's giving, morality, patience, effort, meditative absorption, and wisdom. And he says with this, nothing more is needed, and anything less is insufficient. Of course, that's not what the Buddha said. The Buddha added to that. He said, that's the, that's the first thing that's needed, and then there's a whole bunch more after that. And uh, But... but um, I think maybe a teacher went with that because the thing is that once you cultivate this, then you see what else is needed. First, if I had the whole laundry list, I'd like, never mind. Uh, but to think of, well, it's just this much is needful. But once you undertake that and you've, uh, um, you've elevated your, your consciousness in, in a certain way, then you can see, oh, and also that's needed. Also, that would be useful. Oh, so that would be benefit. I think I'll work on that now. You know, because you have some some faith in the process. You have some confidence that this is really working for me. It's not just he said, you know, but it's really working me. I, by, by my own uh, direct results, you know, this confidence has come. By my own direct results uh, is this faith arising that I put something to the test and I found out that it really works, it really works for me. Um, so, he says that when we are working with any um, aspect of cultivating a virtue, we should know certain things. We should know the aspects of investigating, how to investigate, in other words. We should understand the nature of each quality, what it is, um, how it presents itself, how, how it appears, how it manifests, what uh, it does not do or how it does not act. Uh, what is the antidote when it arises? And that would be then an antidote to uh, a, a deluded view and what would be correct accomplishment. And so this is where study does come in, where reflection does come in, where reasoning does come in. I agree with the Dalai Lama when he said, um, well, not the part about meditation doesn't help much, but I agree with the part about how we should really uh, reflect and reason, and the Buddha gives a, a great amount of, of um, uh, encouragement for us to continually reflect on what is useful, what is beneficial, to also reflect on what are the dangers of certain actions, of certain, of certain thoughts. He told us, you know, like you need to uh, think about three, there's three times that we should evaluate um, 
what's going on and so how we're relating to something. Said uh, before you do it, while you're doing it, and after you do it. And so you know how maybe you go to the water fountain at work and uh, there's three people there and there's somebody who's not there. And when you go to get your water, they're talking about the one who's not there. So when you were there, they're talking about the one who's not there. And um, you don't really mean to get into a conversation around that. I mean, you weren't there for that. But then they just ask you a question, and you know something about the situation, and you put your two cents worth in. Okay? And it's not necessarily anything wrong with that. But now, let's say that... <clears throat> When you started with your two cents worth, there was like an impartial view. But then you heard something that triggered some thought you had about something, uh, an interaction you had with that person. And I think she was doing the same thing to me. And so now you can continue the dialogue. But there's a little shift in the dialogue now because now there's this question that has come up that maybe how I understood our previous interaction wasn't exactly like it was. And maybe, you know, she did, was doing that same thing to me. And now your, your, your interaction in the conversation shifts a little bit because your, your reasoning and your motivation, you know, has shifted due to um, information that came in from the outside, right, into the ear. And so you were saying one thing in a certain way. But now your way of speaking is shifting a little bit. And you start to feel this check, you know. But because that thought has been dropped in there, you, you can't pull back for some reason. Um, and you keep going. But now you're getting into unwholesome speech, you know. And you think, well, you know, there was this time when, you know, something like that, similar like that happened to me, and I thought it was such and such, you know, but, I mean, who knows? Now you just threw up that little doubt, sort of confirming what the other one said, because they put doubt into your situation. That's how easy it is for us to slip off. You know, it's not these big boulders that crack us upside the head. It's the little foxes that spoil the vine. It's these little mm -hmm. things that, that slip in from our habitual tendencies and our habitual ways of seeing and our habitual ways of hearing and our habitual ways of interacting. And so, so he said that we should think about a thing before we, you know, say it. And then while we're saying it, we should think, right while we're saying it, is this still useful? Is it still wholesome? Is it still beneficial? Isn't it, if it's not, so, I'm sorry, I'm gossiping. Take your water and go back and sit down. You know, but how many of us do it? When you find yourself slipping in to the itchy ear, and they say, what? Or, uh, you know, find yourself, just the tongue get just a little too waggy. A little too waggy, <laughs> you know? And, and, but we can't cut it off, because that's just our, our, our habitual tendency, you know? But he says, when you recognize that you've moved from uh, a space where what you're offering is beneficial, is wholesome, as wholesome as usual. He said to stop right there. And you can stop yourself any way you can. You can say, I have to get back to work. And or you can say, Y'all can leave me out of this. You can say, I'm sorry, I'm gossiping. I'm gonna stop talking now. And you know, I mean you can just be as gentle with yourself or straight up with yourself and others as you you know, as you feel is appropriate for the situation. Uh, and then and he says and then after you've said it, reflect again. You know, so before you say it, while you're saying it, after you say it. So before you do it, while you're doing it, and after you do it. Sometimes we start with a very pure motivation, as pure as we can recognize on the surface. But the deeper we get into it, you know, the more it begins to shift for us. But we know I started with such good intention, you know. I really do love them. Uh, uh, someone sent me an email. And this email just real, just blessed me out, you know, just real. And at the end, they said, "I love you," you know. Mm -hmm. And um, 
And when I read the email and the energy that came off of the email, I knew well, they might love me, but they weren't having a loving moment when they wrote me that email. That was the afterthought that I, I love you. And so you can tell what something is. You know, it, it's not just the words, but there's uh, energy. I remember one time I had a, um, I wanted a leather coat. I was in high, junior high school, and everybody was, that was the year for leather. Everybody was getting a leather coat, and I, like a sleek leather coat, too, you know. Uh, they were, everybody had the same coat, you know, it was made in eight panels, and it was just sleek, you know. And uh, I asked my mother for one. I begged her for one, begged her for one, and finally, uh, I get this big box at Christmas time, and I open it up, and I'm thinking it's a leather coat. It was a pleather coat, um, and it was it was gathered up here, and I look like Pillsbury Doughboy when I put it, when I put it on. And um, I said, Mom, I said I appreciate it, but I needed a leather coat. <laughs> I said, I can't wear this to school. I can't wear this coat. And uh, I cannot wear imitation leather coat to school. And she said, well, I bought this coat for you and I spent money I didn't have to ha I didn't have it. You have to wear this coat. So I wore the coat to school. And at three o'clock when I went to my locker to get my coat, almost everybody in the school had autographed it. You know, they they just everybody had signed my coat, and I had to, it was winter time, um, and I had to wear the coat home. And when I got home, I took it out, laid it on the bed, and I never saw the coat again. <clears throat> and so it reminded me when I had children, and they asked things like. They wanted some designer jeans. I told them, you know what? You best write your own name on your jeans. And I remember how I was with my mother and wanting that leather coat and wanting it so bad. And I didn't want them to ever get to that place that they felt they had to have something. And I didn't want to get to the place that I felt I had to buy them something for them to feel, for them to feel important. And so I went through a great life with my kids. I didn't have to buy coach handbags. I didn't have to buy any of that stuff because I taught them to write their own, their own name on their things and wear it proudly. And now my daughter is into designing. You know, and so it, I turned a, a bad situation into, into a good one. And so we learn these things like by precept and by example. It's hard to just get something from the precept. That's why when we go through things, don't think of it so much as going through something so hard. We really get the lesson when we actually go through it. But we also find our strength. We, we, we find our inner strength. And that's what takes us out of that space of having to measure up to other people's standards, having to do things... Uh, in a way that pleases other people because that's what brings a lot of the sense of shame that we feel, you know, because we're trying to measure up to someone else's standards or we're trying to go along with the crowd or we're trying to do what um, everybody else is doing to be okay and to be accepted. So if we look at the first one, given, like what is giving? I mean, somebody just tell me what, what you think giving is. Just call it out, you know. Everybody has some idea what giving is, yes. Well, giving is giving something without <laughs> expecting something to turn on farther in, right? Good, good. So it's freely freely giving something without expecting anything in return. Any, any other? No yes. Effects. It's being happy because other people are happy. Being happy. Giving is being happy because other people are happy. Okay. No take backs. No mm -hmm. take back. Like you can't think about, ah, shit. <laughs> no regrets. <laughs> yes. Yes. Any others? <coughs> okay. So a t-shirt called giving, using something of value to help others and doing it freely. Using something of value to help others. 
and do it freely. So you can give a lot of things, right? Uh, you can give of your resources, which could include money. Someone gave me a car. You can give up your talents. You know, someone who has skill, IT skills, working on the website for the center. You know, there's many ways that we give, but we give something or we use something that has a value. And we do it freely, freely without any strings attached, no take back. Now, I want to ask you the question. How many of us consider ourselves givers? <laughs> okay. Okay, hold that thought. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to know what quality giving is the antidote of. And that would be, um, let's say, selfishness or, or that which inhib inhibits. Um, I had, um, I was always accused of, let's say, if, if I need something and it comes to my immediate attention, like coming right into my circle, that someone else needs something, I would decide, you know, Whose need was greater? Was it my need or was it this person's need? And if it was that person's need, then I'd go ahead and, and take care of it if I could. For instance, it's the twenty it's the twentieth of the month and this person has uh, a financial need. It has to be handled today. But the first is coming. It's just a week away. And I have my house note money right here. And this person's need is, is really great. And I have to decide, am I going to give them my house note money? Or I'm going to say, I, I realize you need, but I don't have it. You know. Um, and what would you do? And so I would get in trouble with my husband all the time. Because I was always taking care. You know, Pick Temple said, don't put off until tomorrow what you can do today. So I was always taken care of today. And I'm like, to run to do the next, next month. I might not even be alive next month. <laughs> 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 yeah. And so I would take care of this person. Now, I knew that they couldn't pay me back in 10 days, you know. I mean, because the reason they didn't have it now is because they had no means. But I would offer, not looking for it to come back. But I believe that it would come back. Now, a lot of times it did come back. Sometimes it didn't. That's when you get into without any expectation, freely, you know, can you give it when there's a good chance that it may not come back to you at a time that you need it. And so some people say, well, see, that's just crazy. That's just, you know, that's blind faith. You know, but it wasn't done in faith. It was done in recognizing a, 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 a present, an imminent need, and considering another like oneself. You know, if I was in her situation, what would I hope? You know, if I was in her situation, what would I hope? I would hope that someone would help me today. I'm being evicted today. You know, you have time. If you don't pay your rent in 10 days, then I got to serve you an eviction notice. That's 30 days. Then you got, so you got 45 days to get yours back. Mine is today. What would I hope? I would hope that someone, there was someone who could help me. Um, and so I would help in that way. Of course, it upset my husband. He started thinking maybe the only one of us should handle the bank account. I'm like that when only one of us is working. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and, but that was my way and that was my nature. And I can tell you the truth that, you know, whatever seeds you plant, that's the harvest that comes, you know. And so it may not always come when you're expecting it. But there is that law, that that law that uh, that sowing and reaping, that whatever you plant, you cannot plant apple seeds and expect the orange grows. It will not happen. And so in that sense, we have... Uh, 
in that logic. No, that's just illogical. I was out in the garden yesterday, and I was looking at all the different vegetables that were planted. And I was over here on this side, and they had cantaloupe. And I said, oh, cantaloupe. You know, because I don't have cantaloupe in my garden, but that's because I didn't plant cantaloupe seeds. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm just admiring the cantaloupe. Oh, we don't have cantaloupe. You know, he didn't say, well, <clears throat> You know, did you plant cantaloupe seeds and they didn't come up what? You know, but, but, it's, but it's like that. So when we think of, of giving, the first thing we have to realize is that it's really no such thing in the way that we think that we think of it. You know, so maybe we could change our idea of giving uh, and think of it more in the sense of planting something. And then it takes away that whole notion of I am doing. It takes away that whole notion of I am giving. And it moves us out of a self-centered space into a more universal space, a vast space where, where we, are, we are all in something together. We all benefit. We all participate. If I never come to this center again, you know, to know that... I have participated in some way in my own well-being through whatever I offer. I didn't give you anything. So when we're giving without any thought that I am giving, and that's when it's giving. Um, so sometimes we give with an ulterior motive. We give to get. And we have to like look really, really deeply. I mean, and there's no, it's no shame in the way we think, it's just that when we, because if we find shame in the way we think, we'll like, I don't want to think about it. I don't want to see. I don't want to examine it. But the, the shame comes in not being willing to think about it, not being willing to look deeply, not being willing to examine it. You know, so we like to stay surface, surface conversation, you know, then then nobody gets into trouble. We don't have to go too far because if we go much further, somebody's going to ask me for something. You know, and so, so it's that kind of way. We can come to know ourselves. Like, we're really, I mean, the real deal. You know, like, because I know self, but you, because others know you. You know, when you think you're hidden, others know you because others are pretty much just like you. You know? And so when you realize that you start trying to fake people out, you start just being genuine. Yeah, I am stingy. <laughs> you know? And you just acknowledge that. You know? And and I don't have to figure out where it came from, whether whether it's my karma, whether it's from past life, whether I don't have to think about all I have to do is apply the antidote to stinginess. The antidote mm -hmm. is go in your pocket right now and give something. The antidote is is for you to go over and sit down and help that one that need help. You know, sometimes we miscategorize what the issue is. Because we don't recognize, you know, and we think it's this, and we're like trying to work on it, trying to work on it, trying, but we can't because that's not really the issue. This is the issue of being You're just stingy. You're so <laughs> You're selfish. You know, and so, and, and you won't even give any of your time, you know, and so it's something like that. And when we look at that and we acknowledge that about ourselves, and we say, you know, I thought I'm a good girl, I am, you know. You see, but one thing is needful right there. And so today I'm going to work on that. I know, like, sometimes I, I, I drive down the street and I'll see someone, you know, maybe an indigent person, homeless person, and um, I always keep bills in my car, you know, so that, you know, when I see somebody, um, well, I would give them something, but the lights get ready to turn green now, you know, so I don't have time. You know, oh, sorry, next time, fellow. Something like that. So I always keep money because it gives me pleasure. Just throw them my window and give them a dollar. Give them, and I like to, you know, like I keep fives, I keep tens, and I just go in and whichever thing I pulled out, that's what they get, you know. And without any thought of, like, he looks like he only deserves $2. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and all I'm doing is I'm working on cultivating that heart of generosity and letting go, you know, 
And so sometimes somebody said, well, you know, he's just going around to get a get himself a drink, right? I'm like, you know, if I lived on the street and it's 30 right. degrees, I'd probably go get myself one. So I'm not going to be grudging the circumstances. You know, sometimes dire circumstances create conditions where, you know, tonight, unless you're going to take him home and give him some warmth, maybe that's the only thing that's going to give him enough of a comfort to live one more day because something might change for him tomorrow. You know, so it's not having a judgment. But once you put a judgment, well, you know, she should have saved her money like I did. You know, uh, these kinds of thoughts we have, these arrogant thoughts, and not realizing that whatever you have is not just because you earned it or you got it for yourself, but there were innumerable people through every aspect of your life that made it possible for you to have whatever you have. To have whatever wisdom you have, or whatever knowledge you have, or whatever money you have, or whatever asset you have, or whatever whatever you had, was, you did not get it by yourself and on your own. But many people, seen and unseen, contributed and brought about the circumstances for that to manifest in your life. And if we think we did it all by ourselves, then then we have this myopic view, and we think that we own something. In, in this world. Yes? What do you think of this, like what you're saying here, and also the common saying, um, it's better to teach a man to fish than to something, something, like in fish. Mm -hmm. So that is give a man a fish and you feed him for a day, teach a man to fish, and you feed him for a lifetime. So what do I think about that? I think that's a good, uh, that's a good saying, but sometimes you have to just give the man a fish. <laughs> no. And so, and sometimes you can give him a fish and you can give him two or three or four fishes while you're teaching him something. Sometimes a person needs to know something, but it's not for me to teach him. Sometimes uh, it is for me to do, but I have to do it in a certain way. Sometimes it is for me to do, and I have to do it in a certain way, but I have to do it at a certain time. Sometimes it's not for me to do any of, the, any of that. And so we come to learn what is for me to do? How is for me to do? When is for me to do? You know, but while we're still asking the why question, the why question is the resistance question. You know, it's it's the why do I have to do it? Or why didn't they do something? You know, and it's the accusing question. It is the the question that that um, it's our self protection question. You know, I really don't want to do this, John, but I'm gonna do it. Then, then you just nullify the benefits. It's like uh, a GMO seed. You know, as soon as you came with that thought, like, I really don't want to do this, John, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. I mean, the seed is tainted, you know, and, and, the, and the sapling that grows from that is going to be weak and miserly and infused with that kind of, that kind of energy. I mean, you know, we need to see these things because these are the things that beset us, that that, that hinder us, you know. So it's so wonderful that, that uh, we can like, just talk openly uh, about this and we can, we can see ourselves. Um, and, and the good thing about it is like, our first in inclination is to say, oh, that's, that's Susan. Oh, that's Sam. You know, but, the, but the right response is like, oh, didn't I do that? Didn't I do that for John? Uh, what am I thinking that you know? I I really wanted to give it to him, but I you know, but I just thought you know he needs to learn how to be responsible for himself, and sometimes that is true. But we need to know that we're thinking that like from our highest place, and not that we don't want to give it to him. You know, I mean that's what I mean. And sometimes some of us just give everything we have. You know, and uh, without any governor, without any stopper, without any thermostat, without any thermometer, without any barometer, without any common sense, much less wisdom, you know. But all of this is this balancing. This dummy keep chewing on something, keep chewing on something. And it becomes clear to you when to move out and when to hold back. But it's, it's a learning process. But he says... First, establish something. I said, even if the person does take what I've offered and they do a not good thing with it, it was offered 
in a good heart. You know? And it's been offered. No need to even think about this anymore. You know? And and that's the end of it. And actually, not just my friend, my enemy can come. And I have lots of those. So, <laughs> but the thing is, how do you turn an enemy into a friend? You know? It's that you no longer think of them as your enemy. And so, Treat them like a friend. That's how you get rid of enemies. Or at least that's how you define them. Take the power. Take the power away. That which was meant for my home can be used for my good. But I have to know that that is a, that that is a law. How wonderful to know that I'm no longer at your mercy. Somebody told me one time um, they wanted me to give a teaching because, uh, and this was a, a particular group, and they wanted a... Uh, I teach them because they said they didn't feel that comfortable when they come into the into the song. And they, um, I said, well, what kind of teaching do you want about that? He says, well, I want you to teach uh, other people something because I don't feel safe when I come in. I don't feel safe when I come into the song. I said, okay, so here's the teaching. The only safety I'm going to have is what I bring with me. So when I come in the song, I'm not looking for you to make me feel safe. I'm looking to make you feel safe. You know? And so that's, I said, that's how you uproot that. I'm not looking for something from you. I'm coming to offer something. And I offer you the best that I have. That is, that is my safety. You know? And it can be accepted or it can be rejected, but what does that have to do with me? I just need to know the heart in which I am making the offer. Because that's the fruit that comes back to me. Yeah. What do you think about, well, I'd like to hear your opinion on judging the teaching of generosity from a cause and effect way and trying to put it in to see if you will get a certain result. Mm -hmm. Like, I've heard that you can uh, see generosity from this perspective that when you give without expectation, you will cultivate a sense of self-worth, a sense of dignity. And when you give and you give freely, you will unwittingly and unconsciously like develop this sense that you're someone who's satisfied with your life, someone who has something to expect. So I'd love to get there. So here's the one, what I, I really think. I mean, you can't. The truth is the truth, you know. So you can't deny the truth. So let's say that you're giving and you're giving without any any sense of uh, any expectation or not expecting something back. But the truth is that you that what you give. Is your is your planting, and that it produces fruit after its own kind. So I know, I mean, you know, that it's a universal law. I know that when I when I give, you know, when I'm that when I'm generous, that there is something that comes back to me in some kind of way, in some kind of shape, in some kind of form that I need it. But I don't not give just because I know that that's the case. I give anyway, but not because of that. I give, but I know that that's the universal law. You know, so. So it, we have to really look. We can know the difference between when we're giving something with an expect, expectation of wanting something in return. And there's no harm in that as long as you're clear about why you're doing it, as long as you're not fooling yourself and thinking, I'm giving freely, or as long as you're not setting somebody up uh, for them to think that you're giving freely when you have an ulterior motive. You see, this is cutting deep. I see the hands cutting deep into what our, our actual intentions are. Because actions, the, the comma is, the comma is on the intention. It's not actually on the action, but it's the basis of the action that produces the comma. Uh, and so let's say that you started to do something and then you didn't carry it out, then there was some thing that was in the making, in the formation there, that was going to uh, produce something like like uh, dark chocolate, you know, but you pulled back you, and you turned away from that, but you got into the mix and you ended up with light chocolate, you know, or you uh, recognized uh, the real intent and you self-corrected early on before there was the actual mix. So you see, nothing is hard and fast. We're like, 
everything to be black and white for us. You know, it's either this or it's this. But it's not that way at all. It's like you have these two extremes. They can be anywhere along that way. And what we say is we catch ourselves here was better than getting to the end. We catch ourselves here, that's even better. We catch ourselves right here, we're doing good. We catch ourselves right here, coming out the gate, wonderful. You know, and then it comes a time that it doesn't even arise. It doesn't even occur to me to function in that way or to operate in that way or to think in that way. Or sometimes we give something out of the goodness of our heart and after we gave it, we have a little bit of regret. You know, like... <laughs> 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 we have a little, a little bit of regret. I'm like, if you already gave it, like, don't mess with your stew. You know, like, don't, don't, it's all too late. Horses out of the gate now. You know? <laughs> so rejoice that you that you gave it, um, and then maybe the next time think something through a little bit, a little bit better. You know, I mean sometimes we can only do what we can do. You know, and I'm saying no harm and no foul, and only doing what you can do. You can only go to your own, you know, to your own limits, not somebody else's. I'm not trying to encourage anybody to go to my limit because I'm not going to some people's limits. You know, I have I have my own place, but always stretching it just a little bit so that I can be a little less self clinging a little less self grasping a little less concerned about myself until I kind of balance out my concern for me and my neighbor. It's some, something like that. And steadily, we improve. And then it's not hard. It's not harsh. It's not self-condemning. It's not condemning others. It just becomes an easy way that we begin to expand in our taking something that is uh, useful, something that is needful, and making it available in the moment. There's not one bill out here that has my name on it. You know, not one bill. So there's no point in me really thinking that it's mine. No, but where can I use it today? And who knows? I tell you the truth. When um, when I was invited to come here, my sister said, "He's asking you to come there." He, she said, uh, "We need somebody to come and, 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 and teach at our place, you know, and, and do a fundraiser for us." I said, "Yes, we do. I'll go." She said, "But you can't go right now, Pony Wadi." I said, "Yes, I can." And they got upset with me, you know, because I, and I'm we back here working, and you know, <laughs> I'm in here calling teachers now, you know, and asking can they do a fundraiser, and she gone off somewhere else. <laughs> but I'm saying this is how we, this is how we have to be. One person has a ten dollar need, one has a hundred, one has a thousand, and one has a ten thousand dollar need. It's all relative, you see. So I can't, when I start thinking my need is greater than someone else's need, I've already moved into selffulness. First, full of myself, full of my I, I needs. Me, my, mine. And so, so there is this training to loosen that. You don't have to worry about going too far. But 99% of the people do not. Maybe 1% goes too far. But most of us have enough self-cherishing that we don't go too far, you know. And if you if you really are going too far, come and talk to the bonky about it. But <laughs> but most of us could use a little bit more, a little bit more stretching. And you see, it's really tied into a sense of of self-importance and self-arrogance and self-need. It doesn't feel like it's arrogant. It feels like it's being responsible for oneself. It feels like it's being uh, instructed in allowing others to be, you know, also responsible for themselves. But if we go dive deep, we can see that a lot of it is steeped in self-cherishing. A lot of it is steeped in maybe a sense of lack, you know. My parents came up during the Great Depression, and they believed in saving for a rainy day. I was like, I might die before the rain comes, you know. But I, you, it, it's for today if I have it today, you know. Um, so, so they learned to hoard. I learned to give everything away. It didn't always work well for me, giving everything away. But yet, it's my choice, you know, because um, if I, 
outside if I'm homeless tomorrow and go to a shelter. If I can't get in the shelter, you know, then I can, I can see. I used to go to, come to New York with uh, Bernie, and we do street retreats, and we sleep out on the street, and so we like, like playing homeless to get an ex uh, more direct experience of what it's like. But you can't play homeless. You know, I mean, we still did it. We still did it because it was, it was useful. And what I learned was that I could come up, and I'd come with a group, and I was the only person of color, and maybe two or three females and all the rest males. I found a man, if he has to go to the bathroom, go behind any tree. But it's not quite the same with us. So I developed some empathy for the uh, uh, for the woman who's on the street. She can't just go squat anywhere. See, she has to find a place where somebody will allow her to use a restroom. So when we had to go to the bathroom, we had to go to different uh, restaurants and stuff, and we're dressed all shabby, you know, and we, you know, we could only have the clothes that were on our back. We couldn't, um, uh, we couldn't bring any money with us, only a return ticket to where, back home to wherever you came from. And, and that was, and that was it. So by day number two, you know, a little bit right. And, um, and you go in and see if you can use the restroom. Well, of the three women, I was the person of color, and the other two were white. Before they got to the third restaurant on one block, the first block, they were allowed to use the restroom. I wasn't. I had to walk ten blocks before somebody let me use use the restroom. So I also got a, a, another understanding about with, within the homeless community how it's harder for some than it is for others. But you see, but this was a direct experience. Now I know something in a way a little bit different. I... I would apologize to the ones of, we picked a place to lay down and sleep. I'm going somewhere with this story. And, and it was a pile of trash right there, you know. We said, oh, this is a good place, you know, like right there by trash. It may even be rats in there, you know, like the, I'm going to get a real experience now. After a while, it's like, boom, the boxes fly open. And, and it's a homeless man sleeping there, and that was his abode. He was like, get away from here, get away from here, you know, get, get away from my house. And, you know, and so, um, and so um, we convinced him that we weren't going to bother his stuff, and we went like four steps over, and we laid down. Well, the police came that night, you know, and the police came, shining their lights, they want to see some ID. We can't bring ID when we come on these things. You know, so we don't have any ID. So then um, Paco was, um, you know, in charge of the group, and he went and he said, I'm Paco, such, 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 from Zen Peace, Max, blah, 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 and they out here doing street retreat and, you know, developing and blah. And so, uh, so the police officer let us go. He said, oh, all right, right, I know about your group, I understand. He said, but you're not going to be able to stay here because the owner of the property has called. Okay, so now what happened was we had to move. But guess who else had to move? The guy whose space we invaded, he's really, he's really on the street. So he cursed us out, you know, and, and I felt bad that I caused him to lose his space. You know, but I learned something. So you see, sometimes if we don't learn something in one way, we can learn something in another way. Now, I don't have to be homeless to know what it feels like being homeless. Even though I felt like somewhat like a hypocrite out there, you know, but I did get an experience that opened me up there, you know. But the grace of filling the blank goes on. I could be that one, you know. And so in this way, we come to find out may all beings be happy, may all beings be liberated. So giving is a way that we allow this to happen, their liberation, through whatever has been filtered into our hands that we can, that we can offer. So he said, you should think like this. However you lean and incline the mind, that becomes, that becomes our nature. You know, that becomes the way we automatically think. And we find a benefit in it. He says that, that when you have this kind of mind, that uh, it produces happiness. 
It produces happiness for you. So if you're going around and you got a lot, but you're not happy, if you're going around and you have a little and you're not happy, he says one of the antidotes to that unhappiness is offering some of what you have. I go around the world, and as I'm around the world in places like India and Thailand, at poverty you can't even imagine. Poverty that goes beyond not having anything. It, poverty that goes down to not even having an identity. The untouchables in a, in, a, in, a, um, in, in a society where they believe that people proceed from the head, from the heart, from the loins, or from the feet of Brahma. And then there's those other ones that we call non-human because they don't even proceed from Brahma at all. Those are the untouchables, the, the untouchables, the unmentionables and the scheduled tribe. So these are people without even an identity as human beings, if you could imagine. And going there. And when I went, I wanted to do so much for them. They can't go to the well and get water because they might pollute. They are considered a pollutant, you know. Or they can't, you know, I wanted to do so much for them, you know. And all they wanted was for me to look if they're walking down the street, they have to be careful that their shadow does not fall on an upper caste person. Shadow falls on a Brahmin, he's considered polluted and unclean, he has to go home and take a bath because my shadow fell on me. Can you imagine the fear that is present? Because they'll beat you to death for something like that. And so when I went there, they're just people to me. You know, I didn't quite get it. And, you know, and I didn't. There are people, they look like me, and we go someplace, and I'm coming, and say, no, 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 sister, no, sister. And I'm like, what's wrong with you? You know, and I'll he'll have such and such. Because I didn't get it. I'm going, oh, my well, my Western concept, and I, nobody's got to work with black folks. And I go in there, and I'm, <laughs> I'm doing my thing. I'm doing my thing. And then I'm, I'm, and I'm actually putting their lives in danger. You know, I have my, my own degree of, of Western American arrogance, you know. And, and then after about a day or so, I began to get it. And all I could do was just go to them and hug them like that. It's like, that's all I could do. That was all they wanted, to be looked upon eye to eye, to be touched, to be accepted as human. So when we find these situations and there is lack, you know, we should come to that point not knowing, not thinking we know what the other person's situation is. We should just come bearing witness, observing, and we should be able to then um, apply a necessary act. That's all. And if we think of giving as no more than that, it'll change. It'll change our lives. So, he says that in giving, we develop a sense of happiness. But not only happiness, we develop a sense of contentment. We're not bound by our things. We come to a uh, a realization of the freedom and the liberty of letting go, of unstagnating, of allowing things to pass through, of establishing connection. It says that uh, we not only uh, uh, please or affect friends, but we also change our enemy. So that we not only arrive at a destination of happiness in this life, but also in future lives. Somebody said, future lives, oh, I don't believe in future lives. Okay, so if there was no future life, you have it in this life. And then if there is a future life, you've planted the seeds for it also. Our time and our resources. What it does is it also uh, reduces our uh, desire for comforts. You know, and it doesn't mean that we have to like walk around ragtag and you know, but it reduces our reliance on things to make us happy. What things?
things that we rely on. If I don't have this, I'm not going to be happy. If I don't get the best looking guy, if I don't get that particular girl, if I don't get that job, if I don't get that degree, if I don't get that A, if I don't get that, just run through the list of what is it if you don't get it, that you won't be happy. Can you have it or not have it? Generosity then is a training. It's a training for us in self-liberation, in freedom, being free of everything. What would it feel like for you? What would it feel like for you to be free? What would it feel like for you to not uh, feel bound or obligated in any way? And, and when I say obligated, I don't mean not committed to something. But I mean not being obligated. I have to do this to be okay. Or I have to do this to uh, uh, feel accepted by others. I, I have to have this. Uh, or people won't respect me. I have to have this. Or I have in my mind, if I don't, then I'm, I'm not... I have no value. I have no worth. Uh, the Dalai Lama said, you know, when I first came to America, he said, this is like the land of plenty. He said, and yet, you know, the people here, they don't have, they don't love themselves. They don't have any sense of, of worth or value. He said, I don't even know what to do with that. He said, because I come from a place where people have nothing but they have a healthy sense of self-worth. What is your self-worth dependent upon? Ask yourself that question. And whatever it's dependent upon, how is it affecting you? Living up, stepping up into it, are you moving towards greater freedom? So are you moving towards largeness of um, an open, receptive, receptive, magnanimous heart Spacious and vast, bright and cheerful. Is that what you're moving towards? What are you clinging to? Name, title, fame. I mean, some of us even cling to our drama because we ain't got nothing else. No, we don't have anything else but our drama. And that becomes our claim to fame. What can you give up today to be just a little bit freer? And so I'd like for that to be your object of meditation for this sit. I'd like for you to really examine your view of giving. Whether you really think there's a benefit. And if you don't really think there's a benefit, God bless the child and it's got his own. If you really think that, if you could contemplate how you have what you have, and if you can just imagine all of the people who give of themselves to allow you to live the life that you live, to wear the clothes that you wear, to drive the car that you drive. You know, the, the vegetables didn't grow in the grocery store. There's some people out there, like, virtually working like slaves, you know, to plant, to harvest, to drive it, move the vegetables to the store. I mean, innumerable people. What would you give for all the benefits you receive.